we did a, a illicit history recently on what she called America's founding leftist about Thomas Paine. And I really like in your work, you know, this, this balance of obviously in no way sort of not being honest or real about all of America's, you know, many, many, many failings and all, and all the rest, but also that when we root ourselves in a radical tradition, wherever we want to position ourselves here, that we can argue and trace our own line within this country. It doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily need to be outside of it. Um, can you trace the lineage of Thomas Paine to FDR and kind of what is this American yeah, left or yeah, radical no, no, project? Absolutely. Well, okay, so let me start with FDR and work back in a, yeah, in a way. Either way, go whatever so, way you want. So it, it's interesting to note that we played the uh, the Four Freedom speech. Yes. Right? And that's in January of 1941. The United States is not yet at war, but Roosevelt has enough savvy and real intelligence, as in military intelligence and otherwise, to know that Hitler's war plans definitely include the United States. Right. And um, th they even knew how he was going to do it, in the sense of go to North Africa. Yeah, we always talk about North Africa as a target of Hitler because of oil reserves. But it was also the case he wanted to come down to West Africa, cross over to Brazil. And don't forget, a lot of the southern uh, cone area was actually dominated by, you know, sort of pseudo-populist militia types, basically fascists. Right. And the idea was to come across there and then come up through Mexico. And they were the Germans were investing a lot in Mexico in hopes of getting the Mexican government to come over. Um, oh, I can go off on a tangent now with Steinbeck, who actually reported on this kind of stuff. Talk about it. I love it. Well, yes, yeah, uh, Steinbeck, because of his commitment to the New Deal and because of the success of the novel Grapes of Wrath that both Roosevelt's embraced, publicly embraced, um, Roosevelt invited Steinbeck to, uh, to D.C. to meet with him. And at that meeting, uh, Steinbeck reported on his own recent travels in Mexico and said that he was amazed by how much money was being spent in, in Mexico by Germans in order to cultivate uh, public opinion in Mexico. And Steinbeck's plan was he was urging Roosevelt to start counterfeiting German marks with the idea of just wrecking the economy of, of Germany at that moment. Anyhow, so, wow. but, so, Fascinating. Okay. so, yeah. So he's so investing in Mexico. So, so he's investing in uh, Hitler. So, no, is so investing, Hitler's in, investing Mexico. in Mexico. Because the idea was FDR to come has up and this basically. Intelligence. So you would, you would be able to hit on the coast. I mean, the submarines were off the coast regularly. They used to be right. able to, you know, they had to turn the lights. People wondered what are they doing? They're turning the lights off in Atlantic City and everywhere else. But everyone knew in military that the Germans were right on the coast waiting for opportunities. In military. Yeah. Okay. okay great. So, yes. so, so basically, the idea was to line up a whole series of potential uh, staging points. Sort of like set a ring. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. And and yeah. the other thing was that I guess it was Goebbels who said um, that it would be easy to defeat the United States. There were so many divisions in the United States, not not military divisions, oh, but yeah, yeah. religious Within and society. racial in right. society, right. that it would be like, you know, t plucking a string and all the divisions would just literally break. And the it. Nazis were very influenced by the American South and those laws, yes. literally Jim Crow in right. the South. So they must right. have also seen a natural affinity yeah, well, uh, well, with a lot of American yeah. politics. Yeah. And, and let's not forget. And also, that, of course, corporate titans were supportive right. of Hitler. Well, as in well. fact, I mean, we could go a step further and yeah. uh, go a bit off track here. No, no, wherever. Let's not forget. I mean, if you were basically taking a, a note out of uh, Goebbels' playbook, think about Trump's strategy and tactics right. for dividing America, okay, and whose interests that might be in, right? Right. So, you know, these are things... I'll come back to that later, okay? Let's, but let's go with the... So we're back to the Four Freedoms. So four he, freedoms. Sees, he knows the intelligence, so he's, he sees he's, what's right. happening. And he's announced... Basically, the Four Freedoms speech we listened to was Roosevelt's call to arms, even though... It, Pearl Harbor's 11 months away in December, right, of 41. Mm -hmm. So the thing is that December 9th, 1941, Roosevelt um, is December 7th, and December 9th, I believe it is, he goes before Congress and he does his speech, Day Shall Live in Infamy. Um, and he then goes relatively quiet, Roosevelt. And his aides said to him, you know, we're really going to have to get you back on radio. We're going to have to get, have you do a major fireside chat. We've got to, we've, we're, we're going to take a beating, and we already were taking a beating in the Pacific. We're going to have to encourage Americans to believe in the possibilities of victory. 
So they looked on the horizon, and it was uh, February 23rd was coming up. That would be Washington's birthday in those days, right? February 23rd, I think. Or is it the 22nd? I think it's 23rd. I have no idea. So, I, so I, they plan- I defer so, to you, Professor. So they made an announcement. Yeah. They made an announcement. They said, Americans should get maps of the world. Every major newspaper, minor newspapers, actually ran a full spread world map inside their newspapers uh, so that every American would have a map in front of them. Remember, this is the age of radio, not the age of yeah. television. Mm-hmm. And uh, stationary stores that sold maps sold out. So on, on uh, Washington's birthday weekend, Roosevelt goes on air in a fireside chat to explain to Americans why it is that we are now going to face a, a, global, a world war on two fronts, east and west. And moreover, he, 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 he assures Americans that we can do this, which, you know, at that moment took some some gumption, but right. we know we won ultimately, but there was no guarantee of that. But here's the right. key thing. In that speech... But he always had a lot of confidence. I mean, he... He exuded he confidence. He exuded yes. confidence, and that's another thing that's kind of inter- that I wonder, like... I, I want to go off on a brief tangent. Okay, but don't let me forget to I, tell the pain story here. You know, okay. we're going to get back to... Believe okay. me, trust me, I've got all of it. Good. I've got a great brain, Harvey. So, I, the, the... I listen um, all the time. Thank you. I'm actually I'm truly honored by that. There, when when there, there's I mean I'm honored by everybody listening, but obviously there are people. I don't get to listen, listen live. I'm usually listening late at night. Oh well, then I don't. Then I'm. You're not in the there. YouTube I'm comments. I'm not honored anymore. What's that? You're not in the YouTube comments. You're not. <laughs> <laughs> You're actually, an idiot. Actually, actually it's, I wonder how much it's weed when that I wake smokes. Up in the middle of the night. It's a Tuesday night. I wait, or a Wednesday morning. I wake up in the middle of the night and I think I got to listen to something and I don't want to listen to the. It's Tuesday. It's a new. It's a new installment. Ah, that's right. And I tune in. And <laughs> I tune. In. I love it. I'm with a little pillow uh, uh, speaker under my, because my wife wouldn't be. Do able you to ever? Do you ever wake her up because you're laughing at the Obama impressions? <laughs> 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 Are you asleep back there? No. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No. 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 She's with me. She's right. great. We've got. A, we've got a new fan. So. But but I've I've want but. It's not that there obviously haven't been. I mean, of course. I mean, uh, maybe Table Kennedy, because that's still actually relatively close to Roosevelt. But in, the, in modern politics, Clinton and Obama obviously had exceptional charisma, which was not connected to the policies of, of, a, of that sort of tradition in many ways. But can, and can I interject for a second? Yeah. But, but uh, don't, don't let me forget, because we could be here all night, of course. But let me, I will compare Roosevelt Clinton and Obama. I, we're, I want to get there, but I do want to get that. Why is it with the exception of those of, of the just setting the confidence and the charisma of those three aside? How did I mean, you look at a Chuck Schumer. How did Republicans even stole like confidence from yes, FDR? Right. And you hear and you see because because so much Reagan. Of the complaint again. Reagan's the thief. OK, I'm, Reagan's and that's the thief. serious. I wrote a yeah. book about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because it's just amazing to me when you look at these people, and I, and I was getting to this in the in the in the in the in the Supreme Court conversation. It's not. It, it is first and foremost a, a major political divide, but it's also just a a generations and crops of these of of people in Democratic leadership that just have no ability to evoke anything, even regardless of the policy portfolio. And F- I mean, and then you go to FDR, and it's like a rendezvous with destiny. Yeah, I mean, that, nothing to fear right. but fear itself. I mean, these things are said, but if you, especially if you listen to the whole speeches, I mean, and as you say, in a context where victory was not guaranteed, where serious problems were going on, massive amount of human suffering, domestically and internationally. Right. But anyway, I, but yeah, four different thoughts. Yeah, one, FDR's confidence. Yes. Okay. The confidence was because. He knew American history. He was probably the history teacher in chief. And in fact, the one th- in fact, in many ways, and we can come back to this, there's something very, very much the same about Lincoln and Roosevelt, even though Lincoln was ultimately a sort of Calvinist, fatalist kind of guy. He seemed a lot more melancholic. He, he did. Yeah. He was, in fact. Yeah. But, it, but there was a fundamental confidence that he had in the American experience. And that's what Roosevelt had. But it wasn't merely the history itself. They had a certain confidence actually in working people. Hmm. And that's the fundamental. And that's, that's the what fundamental. the Democrats have not had 
probably since FDR. Truman more than the, the, those who followed, okay? Right. But especially FDR. And, and, I, and we, we, I could go on about that, um, you know. But, but So he tells them, so the four free, so the maps are in the newspapers. So that, right, so and he returns okay, to the idea, and what he does is so, and here's what he does. He opens this fireside chat of February 23rd, 1942, recalling Washington's defeats mm. in New York and the retreat across New Jersey. And he then segues to MacArthur in the Pacific and, and basically explaining this MacArthur, war we're getting into, guy. okay? Great guy, yes. Yeah, no, let's not no, go sorry. to MacArthur. We won't go there. Yeah, I was going to okay? say, maybe really, right, we, uh, okay. Uh, look, one of the reasons MacArthur was in the Philippines was just to make sure he wasn't anywhere near Washington, D.C. Right. Okay? Right. So, so thinking about, but here's the thing. Roosevelt goes through this very lengthy address to the American people, which yeah. is one of the most listened to speeches that he'd done on the radio. And then he closes with Thomas Paine. And he says, when, you know, when, when things look so bad, before they crossed the Delaware, Washington had his officers read Thomas Paine's The Crisis. The common sense was the year before, The Crisis, which opens with, with these are the times that try men's souls. And he mm -hmm. goes on. And basically what he says, Roosevelt, is... Thomas Paine spoke for Americans in 1776, and he speaks for Americans today. And this was the first time that a, that a sitting president or you know, a governing president quoted Thomas Paine openly and confidently since Jefferson. Others had quoted him but never mentioned his name because he was too much of a radical for them to bring into the public debate, you might say. But Roosevelt had this confidence about Americans. Plus, he, he'd seen what they had accomplished in the New Deal. So mm. Thomas Paine is his guy because nobody believed, nobody believed in the American prospect more than Thomas Paine. And anyone who, who has not read Common Sense or hasn't read it in a long time, just get a copy. Put it by your bedside. And you read that, and even though some of the language may seem archaic, it'll sound to you like a letter from an old friend, and it will revive your sense of what it means to be an American. And what Paine understood was to be an American was to be a radical.